Do you want to learn the tricks that top leaders use to get the most out of themselves and their teams? Well, Naftali Hoff is here to help. Lead to Succeed picks the brains of top leaders to learn about their challenges, insights, and best practices. Here's Naftali. Hello, Lead to Succeed Nation. It's Naftali Hoff, and welcome to Lead to Succeed, Episode 40. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Bill Sandbrook. Bill is Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer of U.S. Concrete, a leading supplier of ready-mix concrete and aggregates in active construction, construction markets across the country. He's a 1979 graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and spent 13 years serving in the U.S. Army. Bill holds four advanced degrees and is responsible for U.S. Concrete's impressive growth since his arrival in 2011. Bill, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Oh, you're welcome. Glad to be here. And it's really a pleasure. First of all, thank you for coming. I know you indicated to me that you're a, a drop under the weather, but uh, nonetheless, I'm looking for a fantastic conversation. And more importantly, I just want to tell everyone from Lead to Succeed, I've wanted to have this conversation for a really long time. A little bit of the backstory, I had the pleasure of interviewing Bill uh, for Smart Brief some time ago, and I'm going to include the link to that interview in the show notes. Uh, we also had tried to get a podcast earlier, but I was dealing with technology issues on my end, and it just didn't work. And I guess it was in the stars or something that we were going to have to postpone the conversation. But I'm delighted that we're having it today, and I'm so glad that you're with me uh, to have this conversation. So let me jump right in, if I may. And my first question to you, Bill, is as follows. You have a military background. I read that in your bio. It's very clear. You're a person who exudes, I think, leadership and confidence. Um but many people naturally associate military training with leadership skills. And I'd like to drill down a little bit with that if I could. In what way in particular would you say that military training is good, uh, a good experience or a good training pad, if you will, for corporate leadership? And what respects does military leadership and corporate leadership differ? Sure, the way it's, it's similar is at a very young age, you're trained in the military to deal with an ambiguous situations with many varied inputs, some of which you have confidence in and some of which you don't. And you do not have the luxury of a long time for analysis. So you have to be able to very quickly synthesize disparate pieces of information, come up with a with a decision or a conclusion, action, an action plan, and execute to that uh, and and <laughs> hopefully be be more right than wrong in that decision through all those various inputs. And, and you have, you know, similarities in, in business with the fast pace of change. Every, every decade, people say industry is progressing at a faster pace. And you look, and 10 years later, it, it not only comes true, the pace is faster. So senior executives and CEOs these days have to be able to, to look forward with, with, ambiguous information and, and plot a plot a course in an ever-changing environment and that that's very 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 similar to uh to the the military training and and military leadership skills you, you learn both on the battlefield and 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 in preparing for for those situations as far as the way it's it's different you know in, in the in the military you can basically when you're an officer or you're a superior, you can order people, they salute and say yes, and then pretty pretty uh, more than like will go off and, and, and accomplish what you have told them to do. It's a little bit more political, even at the CEO level and, and middle management level of, of business, that just by saying something at a staff meeting, you really do need to make sure you have a plan to follow up on, on the execution of that directive and mechanisms to, to make sure there's progress to that, to that goal and objective. Because it's just not in, in, in civilian human nature to, to salute and, uh, and to walk off the cliff for your boss. So you do have to follow up a lot more in a civilian world than you would in the military. That's a great answer, and there's a lot to unpack there, Bill. Um, I, I'm curious because you talked about, as one of the things, the idea how the military kind of prepared you with the ambiguity of many of your situations and trying to sift through the information that you're getting and make decisions. So what, what tips would you offer 
for somebody who's listening to our conversation and is trying to project into the future and does have a lot of information and a lot of forecasting about what's coming next down the pipeline, how do you sift through various pieces of information and make the right decision? You know, that, that's extremely important and extremely insightful question because there is so much data available and there is so much minutia. <clears throat> Successful senior level leaders can, can cut through to the chase of what is really going to affect their, their true core mission. They, they need to find data points that they connect to the future, not necessarily to the present. Um, so being able to sift through that information and and maintain an unswerving focus on your on your core mission and core objectives and discount any noise that that really might be interesting to analyze but isn't really critical to the overall outcome of or, or successful outcome of your business in the intermediate and long term. Yeah, that's great. And so without putting you on the spot and if you don't have a specific example that's fine. But I'm thinking about how can we make this even more practical? That was a great answer, but you talked about twice in that in response about aligning with your mission and making sure that whatever you're hearing, these data points, et cetera, if there's an alignment and that you can keep coming back to the mission, so to speak. So, so what would that look like? You know, what would be an example where you have a mission, you're welcome to articulate a little bit about what the mission is in order that we better understand it, but either way, how does that work in, in, in real terms? Right. Let's see if I can find an example. Um, <clears throat> for instance, when I took when I first came into the company in 2011, one of the first things we had to decide was what was the core mission. We had various product sets, uh, some that were very interesting and and potential growth vehicles. However, they just weren't scalable. So no matter how interesting the opportunity would have been in a certain big business segment for us, for our company it was ready mix concrete and aggregates, anything that deviated from that, I had to very quickly decide because we couldn't scale them, because we couldn't grow them, because we couldn't support them, that we need to jettison them. So we need to do a little bit of portfolio pruning. And we had to do that very quickly. And because we were in the background on our previous podcast, you know, I, I had taken over a, a bankrupt company. We didn't have the resources to do all the things that we thought we would like to do or all the things that we could do. So we had to be very prudent with the, the distribution of those or application of those resources. And so very quickly I had to assess which ones were not critical and not core and divest them quickly. So they didn't absorb in additional assets that could be put to bear in other places more effectively. Beautiful. Yeah, you really unpacked that nicely for us. You talked about a variety of things, whether something was critical or core, whether something is scalable, whether you have the resources. These are just some questions I think leaders could be asking themselves as they're making determinations, whether you're new, coming right into a new company, new situation, and trying to make heads or tails of what's going on and what's the new direction, or you've been there for a long time, but market circumstances are changing for a variety of reasons, whatever that might look like. And you need to have your North Star. You need to have your mission. You need to have the questions that are going to guide you with every important question, with every important uh, potential pivot or decision that's going to allow you to get some clarity. And of course, you didn't say this, but you mentioned it earlier, you know, tying into your people as well. Really, really asking the right people who you have around you, building a great team. And I know you've done that. Uh, to be able to ensure that you get their input and collectively make that decision that's going to position your company in the right direction. Did I get that right? Yeah, and that's a very critical point too. For the first three months that I, when I took over, I went on a so-called listening tour because you know, most of your employees, 99% of your employees all want to do a good job. They know their job. They know it better than a new guy for sure, by definition. And Perhaps they just were never listened to. But before you come in with a 100-day plan that you've developed from your previous experiences, you better figure out exactly what you're walking into or you're going to fight the wrong war. You know, trying to tie this all back into the military experience. You know, the problem with generals is they always fight the next war with the lessons they learned in the last one. And the next one might not be even similar to the, to the previous one they fought. And a lot of blood, sweat, and tears goes into that first 
one or two years of, of getting your strategy reset. Uh -huh. So before I came in with a pre predetermined strategy, I went out and listened and listened and, and tried to see what needed to be what needed to be fixed. What was everybody else's ideas about this? Maybe they just weren't listened to. Maybe they weren't resourced properly. And uh, so before I made up my own mind, I went out and listened, listened, and listened. Beautiful. Yeah, that's really critical. It's so interesting because as I listen to, I'm, I'm a big fan of Audible. So I, I listen to a lot of books. I also read. And a number of the military based leadership books. In other words, people who were former members of the military, whether they were Navy SEALs or in the Navy or in the Army, wherever they were, um, that then are looking to parlay their experiences and bring it to corporate space, um, consistently talk about this idea about, uh, number one, really tapping into your people and not just assuming that because you have rank, therefore you're going to pull rank to get things done. And some of the most successful people really changed what may have been the historical paradigm about leadership in the military. And on top of it, they also were thinking about how, whether it's because of the attack on USS Cole, for example, and the way that we now fight battles, and, and, and continually reimagining and revisiting what does military engagement in the 21st century, for example, look like uh, in, the, in, the, in the world theater, et cetera. All of this really comes back to the same point about being able to be adaptable, understanding that we live in a world of change and that yesterday's approach is not necessarily going to drive you to today's successes or tomorrow's successes. So you really brought us to a great place, Bill. And I would like to, if I can, move to another question that I have, which is related. And that is as follows. As you're thinking about the future, as you're projecting outward, do you imagine or see any, any changes in the way that leaders are going to need to lead in the future, either because of changing technologies, changing markets, or with a continued infusion of younger talent into the workforce that may just operate differently and may have different preferences or needs in terms of what work means for them? I, I think we're we're right in the middle of that transformation now. I mean, with millennials and, and millennials are going to be followed by another generation as well. The work is going to be more distributed. Uh, personal time is going to be more valuable. Uh, the it, the command and con traditional command and control structures that we all grew up in, you know, they're fading away now. They're very prevalent back in the fifties, sixties, seventies, as as were business structures of, of big conglomerates and whatnot. But now, distributed workforce, the ability to, to harness an, an unbelievable uh, unbelievable amount of, of, of knowledge and, and data. Uh, it's going to make leadership extremely more difficult, I believe, because you, while you're going to be connected, you're not going to be connected in a, in a personal set, sort of way. I mean, young, young people now, millennials, and even people ordering concrete from us, they don't want to talk to anybody. They want to do it by text. Uh -huh. So how do, you, how do you lead when nobody wants to talk to one another anymore? How, how do you inspire? It's an interesting question, yeah. And, and the ability to inspire in a, in a communication situation where nobody wants to even talk to each other or even be in the same room is going to be challenging. Sure. Yeah, it's interesting because I remember um, one, of the, one of the speakers that actually motivated me to start my podcast. I was at, a, uh, I was at an author's event. This goes back, I was in Chicago the, the summer before last, and he actually had been a, um, a TV personality, a news anchor, I think it was, for a number of years before becoming the head of internal communication in a firm in Chicago, whatever specifically they manufacture or do. And he talked about using a podcast as a way by which to manage internal communication and to keep people under, you know, a, a top of mind from the CEO, from other members of the of the executive team. What are some of the ideas, values, and and kind of like use that as a platform? And you're right. If people are not prepared to have face to face conversation to the same degree, then how else can we get our message out there? And I think that's a challenge, probably for leaders, especially those of us who are a little bit more senior, whether it's Gen X or older the baby boomers in particular, because you're so used to a particular way of operating. And then you've got this massive paradigm shift with our younger workers and how do you engage with them? But I think still, and before we move on to the next question, if I may add one more thing, I do still think that people do crave as much as they hide behind in many ways technology, or it's the first thing they grab is their phone and like to text, instant message, whatever that platform might be, everyone still loves the, the direct touch. I don't necessarily mean physical, um, it could be that, but certainly the proximity, the call, 
the direct connection, because we all know that you lose something through technology. It just doesn't capture the same degree of, of, of interaction. So here's a, here's a question. I'm a former educator, school leader, so I, I really am fascinated. I know you have four degrees. I'm not going to get into all the specifics of why you got them at this point. You shared that with me in our interview. But here's a question I have for you, because to me, a lot of what I learned whether it's as a school leader, as an educator before that, and now as a coach, had nothing to do with my training. You know, my training had value. You know, my doctorate had value. There's no question about it. But my ability to go into an organization and make a difference, my ability to work with a leader and unpack the issues and sort of create awareness and, 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 and responsibility around it, which is, which is what I do, a lot of it came from my own reading, my own research, and then mo most importantly, from practicing, you know, from using those skills, et cetera. So what would you say is something that you did not learn from all of those masters and all of those degrees that you have that you did not learn in school that was most important for you in your career? <laughs> That's an interesting question because I follow your thought process completely on things that we've, we've learned and never used, but as a, as a complete package, you've learned a way to, to have a disciplined approach to to thinking and, and problem solving. But something that I learned that had nothing to do, let's see, <clears throat> nothing to do with any formal education. Um, and I probably learned it from my father because these now are things outside of outside of school. It's it's to treat everybody with the utmost of respect, irrespective of what their position in the company or irrespective of what their position in life is. And to treat them when you're interacting with them as the most important person on earth to you to you at that moment. So what I what I what I mean by that with treating people with the utmost respect, irrespective of their station in the company or life, you know, it's an example I, I use often, and it's a personal example in that, and I'm sure many of your listeners or yourself has experienced at a cocktail party, we are talking to some interesting person, uh, maybe a very important person, and that person is obviously not engaged with you because they're looking over each of your shoulders to see who's more important to then more important than you are that they need to be interacting with. It makes, it makes me uncomfortable and it actually makes me respect that individual much less than I would have if I would have felt fully engaged. So I said, I'd never be that person. I would be the one that always be fully engaged with, with people that I interact with. That's super powerful. Yeah. I, I've had that experience and I have to catch myself as well sometimes because <laughs> look, when you're working a room, when you're networking, we all know that we're there to meet people. And so it's sort of like I'm thinking about the present as well as the future. Right. Uh, so it's hard to do that. But you're right, 100%. I think if a leader, if any person, frankly, forget if you're a leader or not, just the notion of be present for each individual in the moment. Don't get distracted by other things. Um, it's so critical. And, and thank you. So so let's let's stay with these action steps for a minute. Share with me three things that you would recommend that every leader does on a daily basis to uh, for themselves or for the people they serve? I would start with a list. I am so busy during the day that I, that I need to make, make sure that I stay organized. So the very first thing when I get up in the morning, I start with a mental list. And when I come into the office, I write the list of 20 things I want to accomplish in that day. Some are mundane, some are very important, but as I go through, there's there's a, a level of self-satisfaction in crossing things off a list as well, uh -huh. so it, it creates additional motivation, but it helps you just stay on track and stay organized in, in very complex and, and busy environments that executives operate in. Sure. I, I try to pat somebody on the back at least once a day with uh, either a little note, handwritten note, a phone call, or some personal engagement to make them feel important to the organization and important to me. Um, and then, uh, and then I, I, I always try to take a little portion of the day to think forward, not one, not one year, but two or three years out and just envision where I want the company to be. And it's, it's not a, a, a significant, it's not an organized process. It's not a, I'm not diagramming something, you know, on a, on a blackboard. I'm just taking, you know, five minutes out and saying, okay, 
three years from now, is everything I'm working on going to be relevant? What do I need to accelerate? What do I need to discard? So I try to do that on a daily basis as well, even though it's a short part of the day. Beautiful. So uh, I'm going to ask one follow-up question to two of the things you mentioned. The first one and the third. So with your list, do you have a particular way, Bill, by which you organize your to-do list or attack it? No. Well, organizing it or developing it is a flow of consciousness. Okay. And then, and then it's just as, as the day progresses. Obviously, there's some that are prioritized that I have to get done that day. Yeah. Some some can get pushed, but the the priority ones then I reorganize the list to say this has to get done, has to get done. Uh, so it's just a prioritization. Type. I'm imagining sort of like the Stephen Covey urgent, important, urgent, not important matrix. Yeah. And so I'm what whether you do that. In, in practical terms, you just do that mentally. The right. idea of organizing what's really important and then determining how to attack it, I think, is, is is critical. And this other one that you talked about, about thinking forward, is there a particular time or place that triggers that? Do you have it on your calendar? What what reminds you to do it? And how do you block out everything else so that you can do it? it it's easy. Well, <laughs> I, I drive to work about 30 minutes. I drive home about 40 minutes. So you have this time that you either are or you have a lot of time to think you I think you had said you, you listen to audio books uh-huh when in those type of times those are my time there and on airplanes I don't connect to Wi-Fi when I'm on an airplane because that's that's my two hours that's like commercial that's my two hours of, of thought time of of the phone's not ringing my yeah. assistant is not knocking on the door yeah why so you and I, I have either the drive time or the plane time to do that you know, they say that airplane time could be super, super productive for people for that reason. So right. some people actually, I've seen, it sounds a little bit extreme, uh, actually will will find excuses to fly for okay. the purpose of creating more pr- productivity. This has really, really been great. And so one final thing before we, before we pivot, um, Bill, if we can, tell us something about how you, I know you talked about you make um, a mental list, but is there anything else amongst your morning rituals your morning preps that you think would be valuable for us to learn about? No, I, I, no, I, I pretty much come into work, organize, and then start working off that list. So I, I don't have anything to add there. Okay, fair enough. So now it's time for rapid fire. Our answers in this segment are short and to the point and really give us a little bit more of a, a sense of Bill the person rather than Bill the CEO. Yeah. On a scale of one to 10, how curious are you? 10 being uh, highest. Ten. A 10. ten. Okay. Um, shower morning or evening? Morning. Morning. The kind of books that you read when you have a chance to read them? Uh, usually military history. <clears throat> Interesting. I'm going to ask for elaboration on that one. Anything in particular about it that, that motivates you? to? Well, uh, World, World War II experiences, um, you know, unbroken, things like that. Just inspiring books of what human what humans can rise to do in the in the face of the greatest adversity yeah you know i'm a big fan of self-help books and so i do a lot of reading relating to that but i do think that when you read biographies especially biographies that are woven in nicely with lessons and morals and things like that could be super powerful best time of year to visit texas oh i would say april april Okay. Weather's nice and beautiful at that point of year, I take it. Yes. Yeah. I've had plenty of opportunity to visit. It's a beautiful state. And um, and yeah, it certainly sounds like a great time. So so tell us, please, Bill, a little bit more about how people could find you or find your company, learn more about your work, any type of connection, things like that. Sure. Uh, we're on the web at US Concrete, US Concrete, US dash concrete.com. Um I have <clears throat> I've done a lot of these type of interviews, and I have a lot of leadership uh, uh, articles have been written. So if they Google my name, a lot of these things will show up. Uh, you know, and <clears throat> kind of a side side note right now. You know, we're a concrete business. We are a, the basic basic brick and mortar business. <clears throat> it's an outdoor business. It's not a high tech business, although we have a lot of exciting things going on in the bin in in our uh, space with. Um, environmentally friendly concrete, uh, the utilization of big data to make better decisions. So people that, and young people that are looking for careers, don't, don't discount you know, brick and mortar companies that are, are transitioning <clears throat> through technology to, to be more efficient, more exciting uh, places to work. And I, 
I would love to have a whole cadre of millennials that are just knocking on our door, trying to come to work for us. We are somewhat successful though, and we can find the right people that that can blend the desire to actually create or make something in an environment, in an industrial environment, and and be able to <coughs> incorporate uh, new technologies um, into into our business. But I, I encourage young people not to discount us just because we're not a Facebook, Google, or Amazon. Interesting. So, so, so tell me one thing there before we wrap up. What would be, if you could articulate something that is a particular advantage? You know, oftentimes we're drawn to the exciting, technologically focused, you know, web-based companies, things like that. What would be an advantage of working for a brick-and-mortar company, particularly something like you provide? Well, I would say our company specifically, because I won't speak for any others, is at a very young age, if, <clears throat> if you display initiative, um, some technical savvy, and, <clears throat> and a good work ethic, you can rise to very, very uh, significant levels of advance and make it for yourself outside of having to to fight through you know 500 new entrants or 500 a class of 500 you know freshman class at, at some big <clears throat> technological company understood you can be an individual stand out here quickly wonderful that's a great thing so so bill before we let us before we let you go and you've been um, a tremendous resource in this conversation i've already learned so much kindly leave us with one life lesson from the tremendous um, experiences that you have that's going to really put a beautiful cherry, if you will, on the top of, of the conversation we've had today. Well, you know, it, it's interesting. And as you get later in your career, <clears throat> I've, I've come to realize it, it's not the destination. It's, it's not, we want to be a, a, a $2 billion company. It's not that we want to have a $100 share price because you will reach those goals. And once you reach them, it might not be that satisfying. The entire satisfaction of a career is in the journey itself. And never lose sight of that as you're trying to obtain goals. The satisfaction is not in reaching goals. The satisfaction is actually, and you realize it's after the fact, the satisfaction is the journey in getting there. Wow, I love it. You know, it's so interesting. And before I let you go, this last point, if I may, there were two times recently for me where this became very relevant. Number one, I was pursuing a doctorate. And number two, I was writing a book. And in both instances, I was thinking to myself, wow, when I graduate, when I get that dissertation approved, when I get that book published, I'm going to just be so happy, so excited. I also thought I'd be a multi-billionaire, you know, give or take, but that, that part didn't work out just, just yet. But the point is that I really thought that the end result would be a driver for happiness. And what I ultimately found is I had much more satisfaction in a way from the journey like you're describing. And so finding happiness in the journey, not the destination, making that your priority, recognizing that if you take the right steps, the outcome will, will come, the, you, you will arrive, but enjoy the journey while you do it because that itself has such value, the research, the conversations, whatever it is you're trying to do, the feeling of working on yourself and becoming a better person, a better employee. And so you really hit the, I think the last one uh, in particular out of the park. Uh, so thank you, Bill, for that fascinating conversation. And uh, we are certainly looking forward to getting this out very soon so that Great. Lead to Succeed Nation could hear all about uh, your experiences and 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 the anecdotes and the and the and the wisdom that you have called along the way. Thanks so much for joining me today on this conversation, and um, have a wonderful day. Yeah, you're quite welcome, definitely. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode and for investing in yourself so that you can lead to succeed. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Your feedback gives the show more social proof and encourages more folks to listen. 